right, welcome back to the 18th episode of the Piezo Shock Show. And today I'm going to talk about how can you interpret an ultrasonic transducer data sheet. So there's a lot of things that the data sheet tells you um, when you order an ultrasonic transducer, when you're shopping around for one, uh, and you'd like to know, um, maybe you, you'd like to know and compare the performance of the different parameters and how to basically, um, you know, intelligently understand what the manufacturer is telling you. And you can also use some of that information to uh, back calculate some other parameters. For example, um, the piezo disc size, you know, oftentimes, and we'll start with the first uh, device, which is approximately the one I have here, but it's not the same one, which is an ultrasonic cleaning transducer. Uh, so here's the um, uh, part number. So you can go look that up and you can find this, uh, this data sheet as well. You can follow along at home. Okay. Um, so for, for this particular device, um, they give you ob the obvious dimensions. So there's the diameter, and obviously we're talking about a cylindrical part here. They give you the diameter, they give you um, the uh, specifications for the threaded hole here, um, and there are a lot of other physical dimensions given. So all right, that's, I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, most of these, as well as from the top view, you can tell that it's cylindrical. All right, and the parts in the middle are the piezos, um, these uh, discs shapes here. And usually the piezo disc, for, especially for these transducers, uh, they come with uh, the transducer elements or the piezoelectric elements are uh, in a ring uh, format. And let's talk a little bit more about here. Uh, first, the style, which says bolt on. Uh, this refers to uh, the threaded hole here, and that's how it's intended to be adhered to uh, the structure or your, your tank. Um, the next is langevin. This, you know the description, langevin, which means uh, this, is a, this has a th bolt uh, connecting the front mass and the back mass squeezing on the crystals. Uh, when you tighten this bolt over here or when the manufacturer does, it squeezes on the crystals and allows them to always work in uh, compression. Uh, therefore, you can actually get more power out of such transducers. Whereas if you just had um, either lightly compressed or if you had actually just epoxy holding these components together, the performance would be significantly worse. So that bolt, that which is the bolt from the front and the back mass squeezing the crystals, that's called langevin or bolt clamped, which kind of gets confusing because it's also a bolt on transducer. You also bolt this back onto your, um, onto your, for example, your cleaning tank in this case. So here's Rojas. So there's a, a restriction on hazardous substances, uh, uh, very famous in the EU. Uh, so there are ex so the ma material for the P uh, for the ultrasonic cleaning transducer here is PZT. So it does have lead uh, in it. So it is a hazardous substance uh, technically. Uh, but there but because there is no uh, alternative, it is exempt uh, from most app of uh, from uh, it ex is exempt from the restrictions for most applications. All right, we're continuing here. There's some other numbers, and it, it does, does just talk about the, the geometry and the shape. So we're going a little bit of a detail here. And here are some more descriptions of the dimensions. So 45 millimeter diameter, 53.5 uh, millimeter length. So the length is quite important for uh, the resonant frequency. So the longer the transducer you're going to have, the the higher the resonant frequency, unless you have multiple modes. One way that you can tell if there's multiple modes is if, if, there, are, if there are different sets of crystals or if the, the transducer is actually fairly long, but it cites a lower resonant frequency, that means more than likely there's more than one wavelength, which can be possible, which is definitely, definitely happens in... Uh, um, welding transducers where you have multiple nodal points uh, you're not operating at a first mode or a half wave mode of your entire uh you know transducer to booster to the to the tool the sonotrode uh you're actually uh you're working with multiple wavelengths here's a hey now here are the meaty specifications so there's this is typically what's always given for piezoelectric material, piezoelectric transducers, uh, ultrasonic transducers, just capacitance, resonant frequency. Uh, there's admittance here, which also you can interpret as impedance. 
there's a mechanical Q factor, uh, which isn't always given, but in this case it is. There's a law of velocity, which is more of a, a peculiar thing that they're representing here, uh, and also a law of power. So the power, capacitance, and resonant frequency, and also the impedance are, are tell you a whole lot about the transducer and its operation. I'll get into those a little bit here. And also the allowable temperature range, which is negative 40 to plus 120. Um, I'll say when you are when you do use such a transducer in a heated environment, uh, part of the, part of what happens is that the um, uh, the other components do expand and they they can actually stabilize the crystals or they can unstabilize the crystals depending on how the uh, center bolt works. So depending on your actual temperature, your mileage may vary on what power you're able to operate your transducer. Um, so let's talk. Let's start from top to bottom, from capacitance to resonant frequency, and keep going down. And also, uh, then describe what you can learn about it, what it what it practically tells you in in some aspects. So let's start with capacitance. So they cite capacitance to be four thousand picofarads, which is four nanofarads. Four thousand just sounds like a bigger number, so why not use picofarads? But four thousand nan nano four nanofarads. So what you can first do when you receive your transducer is verify that you do get four nanofarads. That will allow you to understand yeah, yeah, and you know the basic premise of this transducer, it does work. Uh, because you do have uh, that capacitance. So it's one thing you can easily test at, let's say one kilohertz or just by driving with a function generator and measuring the capacitance with you know, measured current and input voltage, you'd be able to verify your capacitance of your transducer. The other fun thing that the capacitance tells you is um, it can tell you the cross-sectional area of your, um, of your piezoelectric ring. Um, these specific type of transducers, they're ultrasonic power transducers, they either use PZT4, more commonly they use PZT4 or PZT8. So you can go to your popular data sheet, uh, any company will do, and you look up a, a typical permittivity of a PZT4 material. And uh, what you're going to find is you can calculate based on the, because they do tell you about approximately you can tell the thickness from the you can approximately tell the thickness from these diagrams. You can do some back calculations, um, or if you get the transducer itself, you can measure it. Uh, you can measure the thickness and the diameter, but you can't measure the inner diameter. So you can use that permittivity to back calculate. You know, given piezo these, you know, given piezo discs with such a diameter and such a thickness, but we don't know the inner diameter. Uh, but we do know the capacitance and the perm and we assume the permittivity. You can then back calculate the actual inner diameter if it's if you are interested in, for example, reverse engineering the transducer without taking it apart. The next is a resonant frequency. So the resonant frequency is determined by the length and the mass and stiffness of the materials on hand. So usually the front is. Uh, many times aluminum and the back is a steel it's a heavier metal and the ceramics are in the in approximately kind of in the middle um, the the relative positions of these materials the stiffnesses are going to matter more closer to the nodal point the masses are going to matter more at the edges at the antinodes so and and also the length will definitely also determine uh, the resonant frequency now, if you do have a horn, sometimes, so this transducer particularly doesn't have a focusing horn where you're focusing energy from larger cross-sectional area piezos uh, to a smaller cross-section where you're actually inputting energy to your work. Uh, so in, in that case, you may just have, you know, for that for that horn, you may just have a resonant frequency associated with the horn and not dominated by the rest of the structure. So that, that can also happen and, and, and uh, determine the resonant frequency. But in such devices, more commonly, uh, the, the whole structure is resonant. Uh, so paying attention to the lengths and uh, material properties of all of them will help you to understand uh, the resonant frequency, but they give it to you here and it's something again you can verify once you receive your transducer, you measure the frequency of lowest impedance and then therefore you can understand that, that your transducer is working. Before you actually input it to your device, one of the benefits of having these da this data is that you can verify that the transducer has, built, has been built accordingly before you, you know, take all of that time to build your prototypes. Uh, the next is dynamic admittance. So if you take the inverse of this number, which is 15 uh, millisiemens, you can then come up with the um, 
uh, the approximate impedance that you would find at resonance. Uh, and also the mechanical Q here has been cited at 500. So you can tell it is a power transducer. However, the mechanical Q significantly drops when you start inputting uh, more, you know, significant amount of power. When you're testing at low voltage, yeah, you'll get that 500 Q if you measure an impedance analysis, or if you perhaps do a ring down method of exciting the transducer and then stopping that excitation and, and, and measuring the voltage ring down or the current ring down. However, um, so this is a, a, a kind of a low voltage value. It's not a high voltage uh, value. So you will see lower performance than that 500Q in practice. Uh, the next is a low level velocity, which I found kind of interesting why they put that there. Um, I'm not, sh you know, this is basically, this is centimeters per second. So this is basically um, you know, 500 millimeters per second is the is the maximum speed this can achieve. Uh, it's probably related to also the maximum strain then in introduced in the piezoelectric uh, material uh, before it can, before it kind of gives up or these parts start to come apart. Um, the allowable power, and this is actually quite important. Um, the allowable the allowable power is very often related to the um, size of the piezo ceramics. So the larger the ceramics use, the more power it takes. So the, when the ceramics are thicker, you, you have to provide more voltage in order to get that power into the piezo, but the maximum level power will also be higher with a uh, with either more piezos or or a higher volume of piezoelectric material. So you would expect for a transducer that's a kilowatt transducer versus a 50 watt transducer, there will be a huge difference in the ring size and the number of rings as well. And finally, uh, there is temperature. So due, due to thermal expansion coefficients, depending on what they are and, and the components, you may either um, see more tightening, you know, the, the basically the center bolts will want to expand with uh, with temperature and the, the, the ceramic rings won't expand to the same extent. Uh, therefore, there can be a loosening, a slight loosening effect, a, a, you know, a little bit of decompressing on the piezo stack. So you have to be careful about the temperature. The temperature is also important because the polarizations in the piezo material uh, can also be destabilized with temperature. So when this says 120 degrees Celsius uh, for the measurement, a little bit, um, uh, dubious about that it's also considering operating conditions because the piezo this transducer will heat up all the power that you put into your piezo won't be transmitted outwards a, a lot of it also will be dissipated inside your transducer uh, it's actually quite hard to do both um, to measure um, what how much energy is dissipated in the environment versus your transducer basically when you do your electrical measurements all you can measure is the input to the transducer not necessarily you won't be able to separate you know transducer um, uh, you won't be able to separate transducer losses versus environmental. Uh, you can get kind of clever with, with, with how you uh, design that test, however. Uh, but in general, you, you that 50 watts is both accounting for energy lost in your transducer and energy transmitted to your environment. So you were watching episode number 18 of the Shock Show. We went over uh, a, a typical, you know, a transducer data sheet, the important parameters being the ge geometry that you're getting. Um, also, um, they did give information that it's a bolt clamp transducer, but it's kind of obvious for this uh, for this specific case, especially for high power transducers or all uh, bolt clamped or Langevin transducers. Um, they gave capacitance information, which can be used to verify both you have a working device, as well as you can actually back calculate the ring size if you, if you so choose. Um, there's also a resonant frequency, uh, which is the dependent on the components, uh, their stiffnesses and mass. Um, uh, the other thing that we uh, that we looked at here was the mechanical quality factor. And just know that if you're using a higher voltage to measure the mechanical quality, if you're using an impedance analyzer, you'll li likely get something close to 500, like the data sheet says. That's how all the data sheet values are reported uh, for the most part. Uh, except so when you use higher voltage or when you have a, if you have a system that can input higher power, you will see a drop in the quality factor. And um, the final very important part, other part was the allowable power. So the larger, 
usually the larger volume of crystals, the more power can be dissipated. However, if the crystals are thick, you'll actually have to use a lot of voltage in order to get that power in there. But it, but that's not to limit the, you know, the maximum uh, power is limited by the volume of the crystals. Um, so thank you for watching. I'll see you in the episode tomorrow. Episode number 19. Uh, I see a couple of people are joining today. I think it's the max I ever had was five. So that's good. Um, uh, I do see some some people had posted some uh, some comments in the live chat. I'm not exactly able to answer those uh, live, but uh, please leave comments and I will actually line those questions up. I think this question was one of the ones that somebody had asked, like, how do I interpret a piezo data sheet? There wasn't very complicated values here, um, uh, but I think it just does serve as useful introduction for someone getting into these devices and trying to understand one com one transducer to another, one manufacturer uh, to another. So thanks for watching and I'll see you tomorrow.